Ha. Sí. 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 Ha, sí, sí.
Good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me. I just want to say thank you all for joining us and for being on time. Do bear with us. We have a momentary, momentary delay. We are awaiting the arrival of one of our guest speakers this morning. So again, thanks for joining us. Bear with us and we'll be starting fairly soon. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone. Please stand for the playing of the National Anthem of Barbados. take your seats. Honorable Adrian Ford, MP, Minister of Environment and National Beautification, Permanent Secretaries, United Nations Development Program Resident Representative Barbados and the Eastern Caribbean, Ms. Valerie Cliff, UNICEF Representative for the Eastern Caribbean Area, Dr. Alois Camaragier, Officials of the Government of Barbados, officials of the United Nations System in Barbados and the Eastern Caribbean, colleagues of the University of the West Indies, KPhil campus, or specially invited guests, the young people of Barbados, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome all of you to this Stockholm Plus 50 Barbados Youth Consultation entitled Youth Agenda for Environmentally, for an Environmentally Resilient Future. Again, we welcome you. We know that this is the beginning of the school term and that traffic has been a little bit unbearable for some of us. So we look forward to having more of our invitees guests, um, join us as we proceed this morning. This morning, our first set of remarks in, in keeping with our opening remarks will be made by the United Nations Development Program resident representative for Barbados and the Eastern Caribbean, Ms. Valerie Cliff, who is joining us online. Valerie. Hi, good morning. I hope you can hear me okay. Honorable Adrian Ford, Minister of Environment and National Beautification for Barbados. Professor Winston Moore, Deputy Principal, University of the West Indies, Cave Hill Campus. My good colleague, Dr. Alois Kamaraji, UNICEF Representative for the Eastern Caribbean, Permanent Secretaries, Officials of the Government of Barbados, members of the University of the West Indies, colleagues of the United Nations System in Barbados and the Eastern Caribbean, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, everyone. Welcome all to the fourth leadership dialogue for the Stockholm Plus 50 National Consultations for Barbados. As with the previous three sessions, we look forward to a collaborative and multi-stakeholder multi dialogue this morning with a focus today on recommendations that will provide an opportunity to amplify the voice of the youth of Barbados to the approach in managing the environmental dimensions 
of the Sustainable Development Goals. The voice of youth are absolutely critical towards the acceleration and implementation of commitments in the decade of action and delivery for sustainable development. It's your world that you're inheriting. Uh, so absolutely, we want to hear from you. Let me take this opportunity to thank Honorable Minister Ford and uh, other colleagues at the Ministry of Environment and National Beautification for their very strong support in hosting the Stockholm Plus 50 national consultations. The discussions so far have had critical points raised during these leadership dialogues and it's been most informative. The UN General Assembly will convene an international meeting called Stockholm Plus 50 in Stockholm on 2nd and 3rd June during the week of World Environment Day. The meeting is hosted by the government of Sweden and with support from the government of Kenya, and it will commemorate the 50 years since the first convening of the conference on the human environment. It will also reinforce the commemoration uh, simultaneously of the 50th anniversary and the creation of the UN Environment Program. Barbados is one of only two Caribbean nations that will be participating in this global initiative, the other being Trinidad and Tobago. Therefore, these leadership dialogues that are being convened are not only an opportunity for Barbados, but should also be seen as an opportunity to more broadly present an environmentally resilient future in the context of all of the Caribbean small island developing states. Uh, the objective of these national consultations, and again, this is the fourth that has taken place, is to stimulate an inclusive whole of society, whole of government dialogue on the main themes of Stockholm Plus 50 as they relate to each national context. UNDP was asked to facilitate the national consultations and leadership dialogues that would stimulate these debates at different levels with a range of stakeholders. For this to be successful, the youth perspective will play a pivotal role. So I invite you all to please share your innovative ideas, unique perspectives to help build a shared vision on how to achieve a healthy Barbados, a healthy Caribbean and a healthy planet. The, top, the timeline for Stockholm Plus 50 coming up in June uh, coincides, of course, with a critical period for countries and their global commitments under the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. Countries, including Barbados, revised and enhanced their nationally determined contributions, or NDCs, as we like to abbreviate everything, uh, ahead of uh, COP26, Conference of Parties 26, in Glasgow in November 2021. NDCs are a country's national pledge towards tackling the impacts of climate change. These pledges or targets are seen as a roadmap uh, to keeping global warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius, which is a critical tipping point, uh, especially for those in the Caribbean. The pledges reflect and uh, are integrated into national and sectoral development policies strategies, budgets, and targets, including environmental commitments, allowing countries to adapt and develop resilience to the very harsh impacts of climate change that we see every day. The NDCs also offer a key political commitment on the direction of development that countries plan to take. To take. Targets in the nationally determined contributions are made on energy, adaptation, nature-based solutions, gender, and other areas, and provide a national pathway to transform economies and societies and contribute to many of the outcomes of the Stockholm Plus 50 process. The ongoing NDC implementation process for Barbados will provide a strong foundation for Stockholm Plus 50 meeting preparations. 
UNDP recognizes the NDCs as a critical gateway for ambitious action, not just to achieve the Paris Agreement, but towards each country achieving their own sustainable development goals as a whole. I would like to take this opportunity also to reaffirm the commitment of UNDP to work closely with the government and people of Barbados in ensuring that the environmental and sustainable development legacies coming out of these Stockholm plus 50 national consultations are achieved in a manner uh, where no one feels left behind. We look forward to robust and inspiring discussions today led by our panelists with strong input from all of our participants, but perhaps especially from the young ones. Thank you all very much. It's my pleasure to be with you today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Valerie, for taking us through the Stockholm process and what, why we are here today. And more importantly, for, con for pledging the UNDP's continued commitment, not only to the government and people of Barbados, but certainly to the region, given the work that we are involved with as far as, it, um, as climate change impacts and, and other planetary concerns and issues are concerned. It is now my pleasure to invite to give his remarks the UNICEF representative for the Eastern Caribbean area, Dr. Alois Kamaraji. I'm going to take off the mask, right? Thank you, Master of Ceremony, and I thank UNDP for inviting UNICEF to attend this event. You know UNICEF is associated with children, but I can tell you that uh, young people, they are very high uh, on UNICEF agenda, not only at global level, but uh, uh, here in the Eastern Caribbean. I really commend UNDP for facilitating this consultation meeting on an issue which is really critical when it comes to the future for, for the world and the young people. It's my pleasure to provide these opening remarks for this exciting event on the youth agenda for an environmentally resilient future. The United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child states that children have the right to give their opinions freely on issues that affect them. What would concern them more than the future of the planet they inhabit? One of the main aims of the Stockholm Plus 50 is to also amplify the voices of the poor, youth, women, indigenous groups, local communities, and other marginalized groups. But of course, to amplify these voices, we must ensure that we listen to what they have to say. So this is about listening to the young people their concerns, their suggestions when it comes to climate uh, action. Children bear the biggest brunt of the impact of climate change and environmental pollution. These impacts threaten to undermine the decades of progress on every child's ability to survive, grow, and thrive. The climate crisis is thus a child rights crisis. UNICEF has produced a lot of evidence about that. And as the United Nations Secretary General said, it is also the defining issue of our time. Today, almost every child on earth 
is exposed to at least one climate and environmental hazard, shock, or stress, such as heat waves, storms, air pollution, flooding, and water scarcity. But a record-breaking 850 million, approximately one-third of all children are exposed to four or more stresses, creating incredibly challenging environments for children to live, play, and thrive. Children in the Eastern Caribbean are facing significant and mounting risks due to the escalating impacts of climate change and environmental degradation as the small islands face a unique and dire set of threats from climate change and associated natural disasters. These hazards can not only exacerbate each other, but also marginalize pockets of society and increase inequality. They also interact with other social, political, and health risks, including non-communicable diseases. Overlapping hazards ultimately make certain parts of the world even more precarious and risky places for children and young people drastically reducing their future potential. However, we at UNICEF believe that children and youth are not helpless victims, but active agents of change who recognize the effects that climate change will have on their future and take an active stance against the challenge and on many occasions, young people are more successful than uh, adults. Children and young people worldwide be have become key advocates for climate action and environmental rights and accordingly effectively exercise their right to participate. The Eastern Caribbean already features several prominent youth activists on climate change and has seen multiple Caribbean-wide youth-led initiatives to raise awareness and to combat climate change and its impact. Those young people, I see some of them sitting in the, this room. You have heard about hair campaigns, youth activists. It's really an opportunity for me to congratulate them for the great work, the, the great contribution they are making, not only in the Caribbean, but beyond the Caribbean. While the only lasting solution is reducing the emissions of carbon and other greenhouse gases, change is affecting children and young people now, and we must increase our efforts to build resilience. But even if change is rapid enough to reduce the extent of, of global warming, the impacts of climate change will continue to grow with future generations paying the heaviest price. It is crucial to ensure that we do all what we can to reduce the extent of global warming. It is crucial to adapt systems and services to protect children and young people to the changes that are coming to the fullest extent possible. The COVID-19 crisis has presented us with a unique window of time and an unprecedented moment in our lifetime to reimagine what a new global social contract looks like. It has shown us that together we have the tools and the experience to fight change, but we need new and innovative ideas to do so. UNICEF is committed to partner with young people on climate, energy, and environmental issues 
and we will continue to contribute to bridging the gap between the decision makers, children, and the youth of the Caribbean. Since Barbados is one of the two Caribbean islands that will be participating in this global initiative, Stockholm Plus 50, it is a good opportunity for the country to highlight the environmental and climate change context of small island developing states in the sustainable recovery from COVID-19 pandemic and progress towards, of course, the SDG 2030 agenda. The Stockholm Plus 50 consultation is a start, but by no means the end. And we have to ensure that children and young people are involved meaningfully into the decision making as the consequences of the environmental issues of our time will be born, especially by the next generation. Their voices, ideas, and actions are vital to create a future where people and planet prosper. I'm delighted to see that so many of you young people are willing to rise to the challenge and that you believe that you can impact your own future. Thank you for your attention, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Dr. Kamaraji. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, I wish to acknowledge our youth and other persons joining us online. Thank the, I believe it's about 14 at this time. I wish to thank all of you for joining us. And we look forward to uh, what we would call a blended or hybrid session today in terms of this consultation. So again, welcome and thank you. And so ladies and gentlemen, we move to our third uh, speaker today for this quiet, small opening, but um, I just want to say perhaps many of you know him already as a major youth proponent in Barbados, and now he's also added to that um, his environmental portfolio. And so, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure now to invite to the podium to deliver remarks on behalf of the government of Barbados the Honorable Adrian Ford, Minister of Environment and National Beautification. Thank you, Donna. You are doing, for doing such an exceptional job thus far. Permanent Secretaries, UNDP res Resident Representative in Barbados and the Eastern Caribbean, Ms. Valerie Cliff, although you are not here with us physically, uh, we are indebted to your presence. UNICEF Representative for the Eastern Caribbean, Dr. Aloy, and he's my good friend. We have sat in rooms together agitating on behalf of the young people, not only in this country, but across the Caribbean and the world. Officials of the government of Barbados, officials of the United Nations in Barbados and Eastern Caribbean, colleagues of the University of the West Indies, um, Cape Hill Campus, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen, and last but by no means least, I want to say a special welcome to the young people, not only in this room, but those who are in our virtual space as well. A pleasant good morning to you. You can reply. This is, our, this is a young forum, so let us say a good morning, young people. It's so much better. The last time I addressed a group of young persons in one space, 
I happen to be Minister of Youth and Community Empowerment, a ministry which I felt was dear to my heart. And in those discussions, a lot of things came about because we are dealing with young persons. They used to call me a neologist. I came up with a lot of words. Youth entrepreneurship, I call it youngpreneurship. I started the program on the block, blocks, um, the guys on the block and those involved in entrepreneurship, we call them blockpreneurs. Today, I want to coin a new phrase, phrase. Youth on the earth. I want to call them youth workers. Youth on the earth. I want to call you all youth workers because I believe that is what you are. Youth on the earth is just another acronym. And there was a saying back then, and I think it still exists, nothing for the youth unless you involve them. And so I'm happy that the organizers of this session took the opportunity to involve the young persons in this discussion. I think that it is your step in the right direction because at the end of the day, nothing for the youth unless you involve them. They must have a voice and a presence in every discussion, whether it is the environment, whether it is politics, whether it is about the society. There must be active participants. And so today, in keeping with that mantra, I am happy to see those, these young, bright faces before me. I want to also say, there was another axiom that was close to my heart. And that is, a man stretched with a new experience, once it is a good experience, will never go back to its old dimension. And I want us, our rural leaders, those adults, parents, to touch young persons, not only in Barbados, but across the world with an environmental experience. Youth on the earth, that youth experience, youth workers experience. I want from the young child to those who are in their teenage age to understand how to be active players in protecting and preserving the environment. In the same way that you teach them how to cook, we learn them how things about um, all these new fancy technologies that we are exploring today, robotics. I want us to be able to teach our young people about preservation of the earth, how to do composting, the importance of being able to put their hands to the plow as it relates not only to the social environment but the natural environment as well. And these are the things I want us to have the conversation with our young people about that certification and the effects of it. Ocean certification and what we will do to combat. I want them to understand how there could be active players as it relates to the vagaries of deforestation. We must be involved in the million tree exercises that we are doing in Barbados. They must be able to plant trees not because they are aesthetic or because they were given instructions from their parents or teachers. They must understand that when they plant a single tree, that tree will save their lives. And again, a new phrase, a new uh, maxim, trees save lives. The ability of the trees as part of the green carbon sink to mitigate that harmful carbon dioxide must never be underestimated. And I want us in Barbados and young persons to be able to lead the charge as it relates to ocean pollution, plastic pollution. You must champion the cause to rid this country of the petrobase type plastics that will find they were into the food chain and onto your table, causing all types of medical and health problems.
problems. You must be the active players in that fight. Young persons. Because when we celebrate the next 50 years of Stockholm, you all will be past the quinquagenarian of the age. I haven't reached there yet. But you'll be past 50, based on what you see in this room. And then you will have a new discussion about what we will do within the next 50 years. That may be a time where we we'll see the technology, the robotics, and those things being used to our advantage. And they implore the young persons in this room to continue your advocacy. Be the active participants, the activists. Put all your collectives in you and ensuring that your neighbor does the right thing. And that people in your school environment, that they do the right thing as it relates to protecting the environment. Because protecting the environment, mitigating against the vagaries of climate change, protecting our biodiversity, is not only because it aligns itself with the United Nations General Assembly call to have 30% of our biodiversity being realized by the year 2030. It has to go beyond that. It has to go beyond the third decade of the 21st century. Soil and the protection of soil. We have droughts that are affecting all our culture, land, not only in Barbados, but across the world. How do we ensure that the soil remains nutritional, at least the 12 inches or so beneath the surface that is responsible for, the, for us being able to augment our agricultural products? How do we do that? And what role, what role uh, fits into that of our young people? Those are the types of conversations that we need to have. And I'm saying, I'm imploring our young people those who are involved in the science. I would love the day when a Barbanian, a young Barbanian, is able to tell the rest of the world, this is the new cold chain. This is the new cold chain that will not have an effect on the ozone layer. I know they're experimenting with some new ones, but you must be able to say, these are the phytopharmaceuticals that will help with the fight against COVID. Our young people, you have the brains to do it. And I'm challenging you today to use your creativity. Almost everything great in this world has been created by young persons. Almost everything great. And you can go and check the history and see that almost every single creation was made by young minds when they're active, when they're willing to explore the world and explore beyond limits. And I'm saying our young people, challenge yourself as it relates to the environment. I want to see more young people, persons being involved in dendrology, cellulology, vermiculture. These are the things that will save us. And biodiversity must now be the new conversation for our young people. Because in a, in a natural ecosystem, biodiversity, and the ability for us to augment that will basically save this planet. There's no doubt. But I don't want to be there with you the whole morning. Sometimes it gets so emotional when I'm speaking about young persons. But I'll allow you know what I'm talking about. You may be asking, what is the Stockholm 50 plus 50 conference? And to really answer that question, we must dare our minds back to 1972, to a city called Stockholm in Sweden. It was at that time, in that place, that the United Nations held a conference on the human environment. At that meeting, governments adopted what is called the Stockholm Declaration, which placed environmental issues at the forefront of international concerns. The conference also marked the start of the competition between industrialized and developing countries on the link between economic growth, the pollution of the air, water and the oceans, and the well-being of people around the world. 
And we must now also talk about sustainable development of livelihoods because that's what it all comes down to. How we will do things in that leg legislation policy that will cause the sustainable development of livelihoods. As simple as that. And there are some things that we can do in our homes, in our environment, that can make a difference without even thinking about it, without putting a lot of physical effort. And I today I want to make the call to all Barbanians is to allow the earth to breathe. There's a simple thing you can do. And um, I got a drop here this morning. And the person who was driving me, I told him, now when you go in the car park, make sure you turn off the car. Don't let it idle waiting on me to come out. That one single gesture, that one single activity can stop the pollution of the camera day outside. Imagine if every single person in this world, if every single one of us was able to do this, at least for a day. How much carbon they are, so you think, will be reduced in that one day? Just stop the car from idling while you go and shop or you go to a conference like what we are doing today. Just turn off the car. That's all I'm saying. Barbados produces about 2 million tons or so of carbon dioxide. It may be small when you look at the bigger picture of the world, which is about 40 to 50 billion tons. But out of that 2 million tons, 1.6 million is attributed to the energy sector. So it's not rocket science here. This is simple basic mass. If we are able to do things to reduce our energy de um, dependence on the and burn on fossil fuels, then we will start the conversation of a cleaner and greener environment. The word clean and green, another phrase coined by myself. And I'm saying is that not only the cars, but when you're lawning your lawn and uh, you're raking, turn off your lawn more too. So it goes across the board. Well, it's basic things we can do to reduce our carbon dioxide footprint. So I'm saying along the planting trees, along with doing all those fancy things that we intend to do, there are some basic things that we can do to reduce our carbon dioxide footprint. And also to reduce our ozone depleting substances too, because a lot of times we often leave rooms cool uh, prior to meetings and what's not. And I'm saying that only turn on the air condition if it's absolutely needed. So let us make a commitment today to do those simple little things, those basic steps to ensure a cleaner and greener environment. Some of you may have heard about the United Nations Environment Program, or UNEP. Well, as a little environment trivia, the decision to establish that global environmental management organization was taken at this same Stockholm Conference in 1972. Later that same year, the United Nations General Assembly will formalize the decision. You may be asking, but what does any of this have to do with me? I want to answer that. It has every single thing to do with you. Because our decisions here will determine the future of the unborn child the egg and sperm as we know it. Our decisions today is a decision that will be able to combat the existential threats that we are faced. It's simple as that. Allow me therefore to transport from the year 1972 to present. You may be aware by now that our planet is facing severe challenges, including the COVID-19 pandemic. The essential threats of climate change, biodiversity loss, and pollution. The, the world that will be yours to live in, ungoverned, without urgent and concerted eff efforts and actions, 
to change the way that we live, that we produce and consume, can witness an increase in average global temperature of 2.4 degrees Celsius by the year 2100. And I'm saying that this obviously will be an environment that we will not be able to survive in. That scenario will see devastating and untenable consequences for life on the planet. Some scientists are also predicting that our seas are projected to rise an average of 0.5 meters to 1.3 meters by the turn of the century again if our practices go unabated. I predict that you will have about 15 to 20 inches rise by the year 2050 if we continue on this trajectory. On the matter of marine pollution, the Plastic Soup Foundation stated that plastic production will increase by 40% in the next 10 years. And if we don't do anything, oceans will carry more plastic than fish by weight by the year 2050. Oceans will carry more plastic. I want us to conceptualize what the scientists are telling us than fish by weight as we know it. And we know that what happens in the ocean has a direct impact to us in a sustainable development. Area. We consume a lot of fish. Fish is part of our biodiversity, part of our reef and our restoration. Fish ensures that there is a blue carbon sink. The part of fish is responsible for the regurgitation of the sand that makes our beautiful beaches. This is knowledge, common knowledge. So we have a fight on our hands. Today, these issues are already disrupting your education, food, security, supply, shelter, and mobility. They have the potential to impact current career pathways and to order the island living as we know it. It is the fact that, yes, these challenges are daunting, but it is not beyond us not beyond you to rise to the occasion and make a difference. This morning, therefore, the challenge for you and for us together is to bring your innovative ideas and your diverse talents to the table to give us, the not so young generation, new perspective on how to address the above issues as we look forward to 100 years post Stockholm 1972 and beyond. We want to know from you how you will wrestle with and overcome the above problems that are barriers to an environmentally resistant and resilient Barbados. We want to hear of the innovations that make sense for the future. Moreover, how can we create opportunities for young scientists to cooperate with government and businesses to develop the needed green and blue technologies of the future. Is there a scope for a national citizen science initiative? If so, tell us how. And I may be a little biased with this one, but I believe and I think that what we experienced the last two or three years with the COVID is there to augment, of course, what I'm saying, that scientists will basically save the world with their new ideas and technologies and developments scientists will save the world. So it's now important for us to have that group of scientists, those who are involved in biotechnology, those involved in phytopharmaceuticals, those involved in new vaccines, those involved in the different robotics that will help to save the planet in terms of, I know that in certain places in Africa, they're now using um, drone technology to be the seed dispersal, dispersers around the fields to help in their tree planting drive and help to bring the forestry to um, the, the place that we need it to be in terms of those green carbon sinks. This is the scientists that we need and the young persons that we need to be able to drive these things. I'm saying today the challenge is there for young persons involved in the science sphere. Uh, right now, I think uh, last year, um, there were some scientists in uh, the exosphere who were looking at a project called MOTSI 
which for the first time was converting the same karma they ought to say, this harmful karma they ought to say, that we are trying to rid the world of into oxygen. And these are the type of conversations that we need because most of the karma they ought to say is now being used um, to, fer to help ferment drinks and stuff like that. But there must be a bigger picture. So I'm challenging a bar scientist, a young scientist, to get involved in these things. Importantly, Stock 150 also presents a reflection point for environmental education. What new programs and products are needed to make sense for your generation? We want to be assured that you will be among the advocates for action, for people, and for the planet over the next 50 years. You have the power to engage leaders. Look at what is happening today. To ensure actions taken are commensurate with the challenges we face. You, the youth, are the present and future generations of our society. As such, you have the power to be the influencers of change in your community, in the nation, in the region, and in the world. You may be asking yourself, but well, how can I as an individual affect change? I will say to you, look at our very own Maria Marshall, the climate change activist and UNICEF youth advocate. Maria exemplifies the power of an individual to make a difference. Her story of environmental activism started when she was driving with her mother and saw a passenger in another car carelessly throwing a plastic bottle from the window of a moving vehicle. Not only is it dangerous in terms of um, a missile being thrown from a vehicle that can cause accidents and what's not, but she spoke to something that we have been battling for the, since Adam was a lad, and that is the anthropogenic behaviors of mankind that seek to pollute and destroy not only what happens in the marine environment, the hydrosphere, but the little sphere, the land as well. And the Bible says a little child shall lead him. And her voice, her activism, spoke loudly uh, when she had that conversation with Orlando. But it shows what the young people once there have the fortitude and give the right guidance. It shows what they can do as it relates to causing that pardon. As I conclude, I want to assure you that the information you provide will inform Barbados National Report to the Stockholm Plus 50 Conference in Stockholm, Sweden on June the 2nd and 3rd, 2022. Equally important, this consultation will also serve as a valuable input to the upcoming National Youth Policy Development Process. And um, that process should finish around June, July. It would have started with me as minister, and I'm looking forward to the realization of that National Youth Policy, where you hear the voice of young persons speaking about all issues that affect them. I am of the view that we are also witnessing the beginning of a new local environmental partnership among stakeholders present today. I therefore call on UNDP and UNICEF to collaborate with the government and our youth institutions in building a series of local Stockholm Plus environmental legacy initiatives based on the ideas and passion arising from these consultations. Youth, youth, and I want to say again, youth and the earth, the youth worker, each one of you are the youth workers that will see the existence of this world the existence, not only for the next 50 years, maybe the next 100 years, 300 years. And quietly, when history is written, it is persons like yourself who will be kind to the historians as they relate your fight and your effort to save the environment. Thank you. Have a wonderful day.
Ladies and gentlemen, and all you online, could you please give us another round of applause for the Minister of Environment, Honorable Adrian Ford. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, I'm going to invite Mr. Mohamed Nagdi to present a token on behalf of the United Nations Development Program to the Minister. Mohamed is the Head of Energy, Environment, and Climate Change Program for Barbados and the Eastern Caribbean. Thank you very much again, Minister, and Mohammed as well. Thank you. So ladies and gentlemen, at this time, I wish to announce a coffee break, short break for just about 15 minutes in the foyer on the outside. Again, thank you for joining us. For those of you online, we will be right back with you in let's say 10 to 15 minutes and we will get the ball rolling as the work session begins for this consultation. Again, thank you all for being here. Another round of applause for everybody who came out. Considering that we've been battling with COVID, it is so good to see everybody that is here who can be here in person. And again, we'll be working with our other participants online. So it will be a hybrid consultation. Thanks again. Do enjoy the coffee. We'll be calling you in about 10 minutes. Thank you.
can take my mask off. Good morning, everybody. And good morning again. I hope you enjoyed your coffee. I'm only, I'm not hearing anybody, so I guess the coffee was terrible. <laughs> and Hilton's break is usually very good, but um, I, I, I don't know. Anyway, again, now welcome to the working session of this consultation. And when I say working session, I'm, we're not going to make it boring. We're going to try to keep it as in interesting as possible. So in this first segment, we are going to try and set the stage for Stockholm plus 50. You would have heard the minister mention a little bit about 1972 when Stockholm first came on, on the scene, so to speak, where the stage was set basically for us to consider environment as, and, and the human environment as being important to our continued existence. And so just to set that stage, I'm going to ask our technical team to share a very short clip, a very short video on Stockholm uh, back in 1972. Thank you, gentlemen. In 1972, global leaders came together in Sweden for the first ever United Nations Conference on the Human Environment. It was unlike any previous event, bringing together 113 governments to discuss humanity's impact on the natural world. It is clear that the environmental crisis which is confronting the world will profoundly alter the future destiny of our planet. No one amongst us, whatever our status, strength, or circumstance, can remain unaffected. The human environment will always change. Development will continue. There will be growth. This cannot and should not be avoided. The decisive question is in which direction we will develop, by what means we will grow, which qualities we want to achieve, and what values we wish to guide our future. I think the lasting message of the Stockholm Conference will be the realization that man has come to one of those seminal points in his history where his own activities are the principal determinants of his own future. Now, 50 years after that Stockholm meeting, we face a triple planetary crisis of climate change pollution and biodiversity loss, as well as other planetary ills that are affecting our current and future well-being. This triple crisis is our number one existential threat, and we need an urgent all-out effort to turn things around. An unhealthy planet threatens human health, prosperity, equality, and peace, as we have seen only too clearly in COVID-19. It also threatens the achievement of SDGs. In this moment of truth, we need to urgently work to transform our economies and societies. The science is clear. The solutions are known. We need whole of society action for a whole of society problem. We know it can be done. The world came together to fix the ozone layer, phase out leaded fuel, and stop endangered species from going extinct. With this in mind, the UN General Assembly has decided to convene an international meeting entitled Stockholm Plus 50, a healthy planet for the prosperity of all, our responsibility, our opportunity. It will be held in Stockholm, Sweden from the 2nd till the 3rd of June 2022. It will commemorate the 50 years since that 1972 watershed moment when the environment took center stage for the first time. There is only one Earth, and the stakes have never been higher. Join us. Okay, so that's Stockholm plus 50, and the reason why we are here today. And we want to hear from our the next generation, so to speak, who will have all of these issues to deal with, but more importantly, whom we believe, as the other or older generations, 
that you guys have the skills, the knowledge, and the understanding to really make a difference and to use new and improved ways of taking the earth forward, so to speak. So here's how it's going to work. You will see on your tables, those who are here, that you are assigned a number. So we basically have tables number one, somewhere in this region, and tables number two, just a little bit behind, and then table, and then the third grouping, we are going to use our online participants as the third grouping to answer the questions that I'm going to pose. Now these questions have been taken from the global survey and modified to get your perspective as young people. And I'm going to ask them, and I'm going to ask that you respond. When, you, when it's your turn as group one to respond, anybody from a group one table, you're free to raise your hand, and we really want to hear from you, your perspective. So if you need to take a little note when I read the question out, that might be useful. But again, you all have younger brains than I. I have to write down everything or I will forget. <laughs> so, but just take note of the question. Um, and just sort of formulate an answer. There are no right or wrong answers in this room. We just want to hear from you, your thinking, your thoughts going forward. And if I'm not finding that you're answering or that you want to just become invisible in the room, I'll just come and find you. <laughs> okay, so group one, you will see the one on your table. Group two, you will see your number two. And for our colleagues online, welcome again. I'm now seeing that there are 15 persons online. Very happy to see you. And Sam is going to put your question in the group, but I will still read it out for the benefit of everyone. And feel free to turn your cameras and mics on and talk to us. Let us hear from you directly. So let's begin. And this is the first question, and it's for the groupings uh, labeled number one. The question goes, Given the issues raised during the opening and the issues affecting the planet, and we know them quite well, climate change, biodiversity loss, pollution, along with inequality, poverty, COVID, global insecurity, unsustainable consumption and production patterns, do you believe that we are capable of leaving a sustainable planet for future generations? Given all that we've heard, Given the planetary crises that we are facing, do you believe that we are still capable of leaving a sustainable planet for future generations? And this is posed to those who are assigned number one. Does not mean that the number twos or the number threes are being left out by any means. If you have an opinion about answering that question, we'd also want to hear from you. Okay, so y'all want me to choose somebody? <laughs> Do I have to call names? Okay, beginning with you, go right ahead. <laughs> Thank you, just state your name. There's a microphone nearby. Just let me, yeah. Thank you, my darling. Here you go, my dear, just state your name. And Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Taisha Carrington, um, representing the ARCs. Um, I can give two perspectives on this question. Me, the person, deep down feels no, is the answer. The, the person going about living the life every day, having to make decisions regarding career, um, future of family, seeing the everyday experiences in the island, um, and seeing how things have spiraled since the pandemic, personally, no feels like the answer. In a more logical way, where if you follow like Stop Home 50 or other, other um, organizations that put forward solutions, then it does seem plausible. It seems like it is attainable. But in daily life, I'm not seeing a lot to reflect us getting there. Um, so it is a conflict. I, of course, try to stay on the side of it is possible so I can cater my life, my lifestyle, um, the choices I make, the work I produce, and so on. I try my best to align it with it being a possibility. But if I, come, if I be completely honest with you, me, the individual, is only about 50% hopeful. Thank you very much for your honesty. Well said. Any other, num yes, my dear, 
Um, we're going to have to share the mic. Can I have some assistance, please, with also spraying the mic? Uh, sorry? Oh, can you use the standing mic, please? Thank you. I'm going to have to have this sanitized. So. Yes, can you hear me? So my name is Renaco, and I'm representing the Hay campaign. I think to just simply answer the question, I do think that we, it is possible, but a lot of hard decisions has to be made. Um, and when you look at it in terms of the balances that many of us face, um, so, so something like opportunity costs, there's going to be cost, whether it be reducing, you know, for example, not using your favorite milk or not traveling in your car, your favorite car, it's going to have to take um, a lot of um, cost and it's very difficult decisions that we've become so accustomed to that we may not necessarily want to do it immediately but in order for it to be achieved those de those difficult decisions and those difficult um, things that we enjoy today um, we would have to be at least somewhat willing to give those up okay thank you very much for your response do I have anybody who disagrees by any chance or who wants to put another perspective any online participants, you are free to raise your virtual hand. Okay. Um, any other responses to that question? Or shall we move on to group two? You want to say something? No? Khalil, you had any ideas? Calling on you because you were, <laughs> I saw you formulating, I'm sure, a response. Would you like to say something on, on this? Go right ahead, please. Good morning. Good afternoon. Yes, I know. We're, we're, we're still in the morning, I believe. Uh, no, I, I was noting what both uh, Ms. Carrington and Mr. Bailey was, uh, were saying. And, you know, I think I, I definitely want to would start with where Mr. Bailey left in terms of the fact that it requires difficult and uncomfortable choices. Mm -hmm. um, and particularly in view of the fact that we have identified that it is a whole of society problem. And it equally, therefore, requires a whole of society approach. And more often than not, our approach to this is not always to reach out to the largest group of people in our society. Uh, it isn't always to engage with persons who we do not traditionally engage with when we have these types of conversations. Um, and that very often then the conversation is, uh, is, it takes place in a silo with a particular type of young person, for example. And these are the kinds of uncomfortable realities that I think we have to confront. Uh, but the reality is that if we want then to uh, save our planet and to bequeath to the future generations um, a, a, a sustainable and a livable environment, then we have to confront what are very difficult realities. And we have therefore to engage with more people and to be able then to have a greater number of people model the types of behaviors that we want them to model. And, uh, and I, I will speak more about that a little later. Thank you very much. Yes, please go ahead. I see group one is really off to a fabulous start. Give yourselves a round of applause, please. <laughs> Great. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, yes, please. So um, I do agree that we could leave a sustainable um, earth behind. Um, it's more of a collective effort. Um, during the pandemic, we've seen over time how the um, skies in Beijing and, and other areas are polluted. And just in a matter of um, two weeks or so, there were clear skies. So as persons usually say that drastic um, situations require drastic measures, um, it's more of a case where we must be willing to, to make the sacrifices um, as a collective body in order to achieve the much desired um, award, which would be a sustainable earth for the generations to come. Thank you, well said. A round of applause, please. I really love that response as well. So we are, we are sort of oscillating between, we're not so sure it can happen, but we are finding that there could be some solutions that we could employ, and yes, the hope, because we have seen what happened in the last couple of years, where things are changing, where our behaviors have changed, that there could be some positives coming forward. Are there any online respondents at this time? No, Sam? Okay, thank you. So moving along then to group two. Sorry? Did I see another hand? My apologies. Please go ahead. You can make, make your, your statement. Lovely. Mm -hmm. 
Hi, good morning. Um, so not to be too pessimistic, I just wanted to <laughs> offer a slightly contrary perspective. And that is that the, the human condition or human existence is one that is inherently self-centered. So we, like, we want to live a good life. We want to enjoy our, we want to picture a rosy future. We want to lead, we want to better the situation for our children. And we want to advance our society. And all of those things are things that I think are deeply human, from the person laying on the block who's hustling, to the person in the boardroom, to the person on the beach trying to sell stuff. Every single person wants to survive and they want to acquire things to allow themselves to do well. When the question asks, are we capable of leaving a sustainable future, it means sacrificing a lot of those desires. So for some, it may mean, for some countries, cutting back on fossil fuels means hampering their development. And it means that young people will not have jobs and it means that you know, they will not be able to, to grow their economy as they would like. For others, cutting out deforestation means that their farmers will not be able to expand and livestock will not be produced and their economies will suffer. So at the end of the day, what it really means is that you have to throw off all of those wonderful things that you want for yourself and for your family as humans and sacrifice it so that somebody else will be able to have a better future. And I think that that in particular is extremely hard to do, to stop people, to see people suffer now, so that people that you don't necessarily know or people that don't exist yet will have a chance at a better life. So while I think theoretically we are fully capable of making the sacrifice and doing what needs to be done, I do think it is one that may not be possible simply because we all want to be able to enjoy the life that we're currently living. Noted, thank you. Okay, I would counter that and say, well, maybe we just need to learn to do things differently, but I got you. <laughs> and we have an online participant. Please go ahead. Uh, good morning. Um, I, would, I would agree. I would agree with um, Donna. Um, you don't mind me calling you Donna, right? Please go ahead, Tyrone. It's good okay, to hear cool. you. So you call me Tyrone, so I could call you Donna good. <laughs> um, I think that it is very possible. I even think it is somewhat probable. But what it calls for is a political will that we have not seen very much of uh, very recently. Um, it, it calls for a change of mindset, which a lot of the other people were mentioning before, which will then lead to a change in behavior. But a lot of the, a lot of the things that have created the mindset that we have are based on laws that are already existing, laws that have existed for a long, long time that people do not want to change because it takes away advantages that certain groups have and they're not willing to give up those advantages. Um, older people, more established people have advantages that are not afforded to young people and they're not willing to give them up. So young people dream, but a lot of their dreams die because old people, older people are not willing to make certain kinds of changes. Um, old people, younger people, sorry, develop stuff and it is shelved and pushed away because sometimes it's just not economically as advantageous to some established group. So they're not really particularly looking forward to what's gonna happen 20, 50, 100 years from now. They want their pay now and they're in a position of authority and a position of power. So anything that disrupts that is pushed back against. And that's the biggest challenge that young people are facing. Young people come up with brilliant ideas. Sometimes they're a lot more cost effective. They're a lot more beneficial for the society, but the disruptive part of it is that it is going to change how established older people benefit. And therefore, because they are the ones who have to give permissions for certain things to happen, the permissions are not given and the things are not happening. 
So it is going to call for older people, especially those in positions of authority and decision making, to come to a different place in their minds. And to have that happen, younger people are going to have to continue to advocate and even, I don't want to say agitate because that may, that may get some people offset, but do some, make some serious, strong pushes to get those things to change because the younger people are not the ones who have made the rules and they're not the ones who are keeping the gate. Okay. Thanks very much for that input, Tyrone. Um, I'm not seeing anybody disagreeing with you on this end, so much appreciated. Food for thought. So we're moving on to group two, and here is, here's what we want you to weigh in on. Each year, an estimated one-third of all food produced, equivalent to 1.3 billion tons worth around $1 trillion, ends up rotting in the bins of consumers and retailers, or spoiling due to poor transportation and harvesting practices. Should the global population reach 9.6 billion by 2050, the equivalent of almost three planets could be required to provide the natural resources needed to sustain current lifestyles. How much have you changed your lifestyle to support a healthier planet? So given those wonderful stats, the fact that we may need three planets if we continue at the rate that we are going, three planets to serve 9.6 billion people by 2050, how have you changed your lifestyle to support a healthier planet? Tables two, do I have any takers? Do I need to repeat the question or is everybody good with it? Right, so just imagine we have three Earths. Hmm. <laughs> okay, so as I say, if you're not responding quickly enough, I'm gonna choose somebody, but don't be shy, it's all good. We're good, we're good. So, I think you're ready to answer. Please, just join us over here at the mic. Come, 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 come. <laughs> come and share with us. Thank you. Hi. Yeah, you can adjust. Okay. Let's go ahead. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Aisha Dadabai. I am currently a third year student at the Erdison Teachers Training College. Um, so how have I changed my lifestyle? Well, I think it goes to the little things as Mr. Ford was saying, something as simple as turning off your car and something like that. There are many small things that we can do to help. So with reference to the food wastage, I think we can look at things like gardening. With, um, when we have food scraps, as opposed to just wasting it, we can like garden. And you know, at home, actually, we do that with the, you know, when you have lettuce and tomatoes and whatnot, with these scraps, you repurpose it and you grow more, as opposed to going and buying. We even have, um, chickens <laughs> at home. So I feel the implementation of home gardens is something that we did. I mean, in terms of viewing, using the manure, et cetera, from the chickens. Yeah. And people in the room, if you like chicken, chicken is going to be so expensive just now. I am contemplating becoming a vegetarian. I don't know about y'all, but very good point. Is that it? Thank you so much. Please give her a round of applause because I know I picked on her. <laughs> Thank you so much. Are there any other responses from, from our group twos? So you know that you're going to have to choose somebody. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Keisha Anbal from the Caribbean Youth Environment Network. Um, actions I've taken um, to help reduce food waste. Um, I already came from a, come from a household where my father is a, farm, a small farmer, and the ways that we try to reduce our food waste, we try to use more vegetables, less fruit, and I'm not trying to go off topic, but as you know, a lot of us, we come from a country where we suffer from a lot of chronic conditions, and we already 
pushing towards that path, probably not uh, quick enough, but even moving the route of going, using more vegetables and less meat, sometimes using the meat, as we all know, um, already have an impact on climate change due to the amount of emissions that is being produced from those activities. And even simple stuff like um, using more of your scraps. For example, if you know that you use a certain fruit, you could probably use that to probably extract to make tea. Probably like we need to change our mindset in terms of using our foods, probably using stuff like the, if some of us are harvesting like um, cauliflower or broccoli, we could probably use like the leaves off of it. We could probably use more of the stem off of the broccoli itself instead of just using the top part of it. You know, we have to change our mindsets. We have to also, you know, healthy life, healthy planet. You know, the way how we deal with our planet, it will in turn affect us. I mean, look at um, our food wastage, look at the way that we are using it, look at things like plastics that are already affecting us already. So I think that's the way that I am doing it. And of course, we need more people to get on board. We are already moving towards that, like I said already. And um, yeah, that's basically all I have to say. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. I think she deserves a round of applause. In fact, we are going to keep applauding people who are responding because it means that we are all thinking. We are being put in this fishbowl, as it were, to let's see how we can map a better future. And, you know, we actually need young people to be doing this with us. But not to say that there aren't older folks who might have a contribution to make. So I'm going to come back to table two. Susan? Thank you. Okay, my name's Susan Mahan, and I'm not old enough yet to have been at Stockholm, but I was <laughs> at the Earth Summit in 19, 1992, um, where it was the first meeting of all the ministers who had to do with the environment, and also the national leaders. So we had George Bush, the older one there, and um, who was the president of the US at the time. And the only thing green about George Bush was his name. Um, the the, the uh, attitudes and the politics and all of that have changed a lot. And um, I don't really share the pessimism um, that has been expressed from the young people. In fact, it makes me feel a bit downhearted. So uh, I had just a... Um, I had uh, a comment to make about the responses, uh, about the sacrifices and uh, the change of lifestyle and all that kind of thing in the negative way uh, that would, uh, would lead to a better life. Um, being an older person, I don't really feel that I've made a lot of sacrifices and I've still kept to the values and the principles of sustainable development that is my, has been my philosophy and approach since I was a young person. And um, I think uh, that it does require, as Mr. Is it Mr. King or Dr. King had mentioned, a, mind, a change in mindset, um, which you can still have a fantastic quality of life um, and enjoy so many things. Uh, and still have a sustainable life and, and make a contribution to the planet. So that's my answer to the first question as an elder person. Um, my answer to the second question about food security and what's, uh, what I'm doing about it has been forced to a certain extent by COVID um, because I was going in the direction already so I have a little garden that's called a mini ornamental food garden. So I have pretty plants and flowers and trees and things in it. It's just in my front yard uh, on the roadside. It's not big, um, but I planted fruit trees there. And I use the principles of permaculture or regenerative agriculture in the garden. So I don't, I take everything from the garden, the leaves and the sticks, twigs and all that kind of thing, and I put it back uh, and everything grows fantastically. And um, I have passion fruits that are growing all up 
uh, very, very high, you know, into, into um, the railing around my house and um, spinach and all of that. And uh, I also was forced, because I tried to get uh, food during the pan at the beginning of the pandemic from um, the big supermarkets, and I realized that they told me I was number 3,000 on the list and I wouldn't be able to get food for at least two weeks. So I changed to get a um, produce box from the organic farmers and I haven't changed back. So, I <laughs> um, you know, I think you can, and it's much better. It's actually a lot better, you know, you can, I used everything, everything, you, you just take what you get and you use it. Great, you use every single thing. Thanks a lot, Susan. Thanks for your input on, and your perspective on both, both questions. So now it's group three's turn, and group three is our online, um, would make up our online participants. And your question is, based on, on what I'm about to, to share with you. The recently adopted Human Rights Council Resolution 48136, which recognizes the human right to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment can serve as a catalyst to allow governments, legislators, courts, and citizen groups around the globe to take action to respect, protect, and fulfill the right of a healthy environment for all. Do you agree that our country's laws and policies are protecting the rights of people's access to a quality environment? Can we have some responses, please, from our online participants? Do I need to restate? Yeah. Sorry? No hands? I'm not seeing any hands as yet. And I'm minded to choose somebody. <laughs> I see, right, I see Tyrone's hand up, but I'm going to ask um, Rajani, Marshall, could you please go ahead? Um, hello, it's good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, do I have to turn on my video? Uh, it would be nice, but if it's not going to work well, that's okay. Please go ahead, Rajani. Thank you. Yay, it's good to see you. It's <laughs> good afternoon. Thank you. Um, I would say that because we were born in Barbados in a warm climate, and I would say we are not a like, very well industrially developed country. We have the luxury of living in a very clean environment, environment where you go, so you see trees, you see the sun, you feel the breeze, where in other places where they are more industrially developed, that they don't have such, they have gray skies and smoke. But I would say that our country's laws has really pushed us and is trying to push us in the direction of environmentally friendly with um, the taxes on plastics where at the supermarket we have to pay for plastic bags. So it means you are it means you're not using as much plastic bags and waste so you have to use reusable bags. Um, there is the program where we see solar farms going up, which would be alternative, which would be a form of alternative energy. There is also the there is also the program that the government is putting in place where they are putting the solar panels on the houses and you would give the government the solar panels, the energy from the solar panels would be collected by the government. And they are doing a lot of things to push us towards a more environmentally friendly environment. And so I would say they are really looking to protect us and protect our environment and our right to a clean environment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks very much for your response. Well said, Rajani, and for letting us see you. So do stay with us if you can, thank you. Um, anyone else in group three? I saw Tyrone's hand up a moment ago. Tyrone, are you still there? I'm, right. I'm still here. I'm still here listening, but um, I rather defer to the to the youngsters. I was <laughs> going to say something, but then Rajani spoke, so I don't. And I'm agreeing with a lot of the things he said, so I don't really need to add to that. Okay, uh, Sam, have you got any responses in, in the chat regarding question three, which really and truly is asking whether we agree that our country's laws and policies are protecting the rights of people's access to a quality environment? No others? Okay, 
Um, I'm shortly going to close this question. Are there any thoughts around the room at this time? Okay, All right then. So it's back to group one. Sorry? Aha. Yes, can I hear the comment, please? Um, you have your mask. Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me well. Um, thank you, Oshandi, for your participation. So I'm just going to read the comment for everyone. Um, so the comment is, a neutral stance can be taken as an approach to this question. As within the country, there has been recent attempts to meet environmental standards. For example, the ban on single-use plastics and the present distribution of both waste and recycled bins. And while these attempts are some years overdue, the country has been trying and seems, seeks to take a step in the right direction. Thus, the country has pursued policies and aimed to allow access to a quality environment. Thank you, that's it. Great, thank you very much for that, Ajani and Sam. I see that I've got a hand up, was Dan, is that? Damali, Damali, could you please go ahead and share with us, thank you. Hi, morning. So in response to the online question, um, I'm kind of piggybacking off of what the first person said. I think personally, um, the, the laws and regulations that are being implemented now are kind of as a result of this whole global phenomenon where we have, there's more emphasis on environmental presence, pre preservation and conservation and these things. And I think in the Caribbean, we kind of take it for granted. I'm from Grenada um, because we live in paradise, basically. All we know is clean air, relatively clean water, good weather, all these things. So I think we've kind of taken it for granted for, for the longest, really for the longest while because it's, it's kind of numb to, to how really bad it is out there. The laws that we have in place, I think, they're, they're okay, but they could be better. I, I watched a documentary just last night on, on Jamaica, the mining mining in Jamaica and cockpit country. And you realize just how fragile our, our ecosystems are and how really integrated everything is. Our watersheds, our, our everything is so interconnected. And I think a lot more can be done to preserve a lot more of, of, of our natural natural resources and assets because we really are a small community and what might be a small scale something in a larger community, it, it really affects a lot more of us. So I think we can do a lot more in that regard. Thank you. Thank you very much, Damali. I see Alice Lord's hand up. Alice, please go ahead. Hi, good morning. I'm representing Project Discovery this morning. I just want to agree with everyone that I do think the government is heading in the right direction. And I also want to commend them on the project, the Constitutional River project, because they saw that they're adding, they planted some mangroves and stuff in that area to help with the flood, flood mitigation. And I just want to commend that. Thank you very much. And Kiana, you're up next. Kiana. Barrow. Hey, good morning. I don't believe the policies are in favor of the environment. Personally, because I am currently doing research on wetlands around Barbados. Um, about two weeks ago, there was a movie being filmed at Long Pond. Long Pond is a natural wetland ecosystem. The movie, the directors and what's not, they were dumping a whole bunch of marl into the water, which eventually changes the characteristics of the water because even when I tested the water, it was high in phosphates. So this is eventually going to kill what little mangroves we have left. All the mangrove trees running up into walkers, they're dying, they're very few. Graham Hall, the canal is accessible to the public and that should not be. It is very, very, very dirty. There's sewage, sewage sorry, being dumped into it constantly that was another site that I had to test as well. There are no policies in place to protect these ecosystems. And that is a problem. Thanks very much for sharing, Kiana. Um, yes, I'm sorry to hear about those uh, environmental vagaries. 
Um, but yeah, you're right to call it out. And I am certain that even through this medium and, and with our conversation here today, the correct authorities should perhaps investigate those occurrences because there's nothing about what happened there that we can deem positive, nor within the context of the law or any policy that I'm aware of. I see Tyrone's hand is up again. Please go ahead, Tyrone. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting because the, the question the question is about whether or not the laws are in place. Mm -hmm. And the, 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 <laughs> the thing is, you can have a lot of laws that are in place. Well, you, have, you can have a lot of laws that are written that are merely suggestions because they're either not enforced or the consequence for violation is trivial and almost meaningless in the context. So the issue may not be that the laws are not in place. The question is, what is the monitoring situation? What are the consequences for violators? Because if those things, if the enforcement is not proper and the monitoring is not regular and adequate, then the law is really ineffective. It could as well not be there. Agreed. I have to agree with you on that. Thanks very much, Tyrone. So I'm moving back to group one. I'm not, not trying to, um, well, you know, we're kind of pressed as always for time, but I find this input and, and the, the, um, the responses are really, really positive. So group one again, welcome back. <laughs> what actions are required to stimulate a greener, more inclusive recovery that creates opportunities for our youth? What actions are required to stimulate a greener, more inclusive recovery that creates opportunities for our youth? Am I seeing any hands go up from our group one participants? You want to answer? You want to repeat? Okay, again, what actions are required to stimulate a greener, more inclusive recovery that creates opportunities for our youth. And in the context of COVID and, and so on, there's a lot of discussion about recovery. How do we recover, especially from an economic and environmental perspective on something that has basically damaged our social well-being as well? Any takers? Jerome? No, 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 no. I saw you look up, so I thought that perhaps you would like to share your thoughts. Thank you. Greetings. Um, I don't think I got an answer to this question, but I got a reflection. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I would say is that when we talk about recovery, we're just talking about doing better. We're talking about we want life to be nice. Everybody wants life to be nice. We want to eat the food, we want to relax, we want to engage in things that can make me feel more fulfilled as individuals. And especially as young people, we may have these dreams and aspirations, but one of the things that we need to have to push these actions forward is a connection between these dreams and reality between the paperwork and the lofty things and the process, the practice. And I think that when you do leave school, when you do start your careers, you do see these lofty targets on the horizon that you should go towards. But what our work plan and that action plan is with the resources that we got available, given different scenarios, because we may be in the pop down life hard scenario right now, but there will also be the life nice island in the sun scenario I don't need sun crystal, where you may then need to use a different work plan and having that well laid out that somebody who now left school and we didn't know as much as, as um, Susan or you, Donna, having that work plan so you know I can fit into this cell and these are the steps that I need to take in order to fulfill these sustainable development goals as well as live nice and know I could pay my bills and sit down and watch the sunset and not worry about tomorrow. And that's the reflection I got, which is understanding the practice and having a work plan for it. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's what popped in my mind. Thanks for sharing your thoughts. And you see you've got great support. 
<laughs> Thank you, Jerome. Any other, any other perspectives from group one? Ashley, perhaps, you had any thoughts? Basically on perhaps how we can stimulate greener, more inclusive recovery that creates opportunities for our youth. Let me try to tackle this question. Um, for me, when it comes to creating opportunities for our young persons, the climate crisis to date poses a great threat to the achievement and attainment of the Sustainable Development Goals. So how can we as a society speak or talk about creating a prosperous, a prosperous world for all when our sustainable goals are being hindered on a daily basis? Um, as a country like Barbados, coming from a small island developing state, what we have realized is after a disaster has hit many small nations, um, many countries have to go and borrow um, a lot from different, for larger countries who are contributing the most to the um, greenhouse gas emissions. And that poses a hindrance on our economy, as we know. And once we as a society, our, our governments have to constantly be borrowing money from these larger, like the IMF and these larger um, countries, then how can we build a prosperous world for our young on persons and I believe that um, there needs to be more grant funding that is available for countries in order to seriously build on their resilience and adapt better and mitigate better to the um, climate crisis and we can only provide sustainable opportunities for our young persons if there's more funding than is being that if there's more funding that is being given to small countries like Barbados thank you thank you very much Go ahead. Very well said. Thank you. We can't do very much without the appropriate finances. Agreed. Yes, please. Yeah, so if I can narrow it down a bit. When I hear the word recovery, um, I think about a time in the past where some person or something was and they obviously has, have lost the, um, I don't know, that being and is currently in an attempt to get back to that um, point, right? Um, speaking of sustainability and a more inclusive environment for youth and speaking greener, um, I don't think that where we are now is where we would have liked to be. So to say recovery in, in that sense may be a bit of a, I don't know, a, injustice or a little inaccurate yeah a little inaccurate right so um what i could say is um and if i could narrow it down again i think that the offering of give back hours um from the government provides the opportunity for more of the environmental friendly agencies to to grab those students who are fresh out of university and looking for a way forward Right? that we could drive them towards that direction in creating a more sustainable world um, is not a case where we need to be paying them a, a large salary weekly. So um, the, the opportunity to serve and serve in a geared direction, I think that would do us a justice as, as we seek to find a more inclusive and a greener, a greener um, world. Thank you so much. Very good idea. Very well said. Yes, please go ahead. Mm -hmm. We've got someone from group two who is also weighing in. Please go ahead. Thank um, you. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Janissa from CYEN. Welcome. And I just wanted to agree with what Ashley mentioned about um, basically providing a more financial assistance to the young people to become more or fully engaged in the, envir I mean, in the national environment management process and also like funding should be in addition to the GEF small grants fund um, perhaps the ministry of the environment could establish the governor general's award which is formerly known as I mean which is known as the president award program and its funding program so that's basically it thank you very much a round of applause as well yes go ahead and then I see we have an online participant after. Go ahead, please. Um, 
So for me, I think it needs to start outside the ring before we get as narrow as green and youth um, and focusing on the inclusivity aspect. In a small country, as Ashley mentioned, that often lacks funding to implement things to the level that other countries can, a lot of the time the individuals are left to meet halfway or quarter way. And a lot of our youth are unable to meet. So there might be a program in place to help somebody, I don't know, plant trees or understand different parts of our environment and so on. But the people who really, you know, everybody is not included in that initiative. So for me, a uh, approach would be to, to show how a green approach is relevant in every aspect of um, a school program, for example. So you can't limit it to like the sciences, but you have to include it in the arts, you have to include it in the engineering, you have to include it in every aspect of what we are learning in schools so that everybody is equipped to know how within their individual practice they can implement a greener approach. Because there's not a lot of references that are nuanced to Barbados or the Caribbean that we as individuals can access and be like, oh, I want to be an artist, how do I have a green practice? Or I want to be a doctor, what does green have to do with me? Um, so I think it has to start wider and show how in, in each of these individual fields, uh, you can take a more green approach. And therefore it would then work up to being more inclusive and work up to a more, a green recovery plan. Fantastic, thank you so much. <laughs> very, very good indeed. I'm loving this rich discussion. I see Tyrone has his hand up online as well. You're weighing in on question one. Yeah, Tyrone, I am. Please. And I am in 100% agreement with our last speaker. Um, at Project Discovery, we recognize a while ago that um, when we started our program, it was, it was for older teenagers. But then we recognize that if you really want to make a difference, you got to go younger. So we have to we lowered our um, eligibility age for membership all the way down to the beginning of your teenage years. Then what we do is we write programs that demonstrate that the environment is not a science-based um, entity alone. Because like a lot of people are coming up talking about the need for funding, but as was stated just now, how many of our students who study accounts or principles of business or economics or whatever at secondary school or university, especially up to the bachelor's degree level, very few of those are really exposed to the intricacies of the relationship. Ty, I think you, Tyrone, I think you muted yourself. Could you unmute? We lost you halfway. Oh, through. I'm very sorry. I'm very sorry. <laughs> That's um, okay. I don't know. I don't know what's the last thing you heard. Um, anybody? So <laughs> you were talking about the intricacies of of economic students, accounts, right. the accounting intricacies persons. of in, 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 in economics, accounting, and and the environment. A lot of people don't do that. So like. Um, even if you take a, and, and the fact that it goes across many different disciplines, um, because environmental science is different from environmental studies and environmental science only caters to the science of the environment. But we need to have programs in environmental studies. We need to get people to get the linkages. We need to approach those people before they choose what subjects they want to do for fourth form, for CSEC. We need to help them to understand the relationship between all the different things. So a lot of this cannot be done in school because of the way that school is structured. And therefore there is a need for programs like CYEN and Project Discovery and um, organizations like that in order to give young people an opportunity to collaborate and bring all of these things together. Last point I'm gonna make for now. 
in the COVID situation that we've been going through in the last two years or so, two and a half years, especially with schools and things, Project Discovery, and this goes back to a lot of the things that the young people have been saying. Project Discovery um, presented a solution that was devised by students to fix a major online, a major problem with the online learning teaching process. And this is why I'm saying there has to be um, an, the, the money issue. The money issue is a big issue because what a lot of young people are going to find out is if they come up with environmental solutions that are economically disruptive to persons who are established, they are going to find that their solutions are not going to be accepted. They're not going to be given the opportunity. And that has got to change. You cannot be telling young people, we are embracing you, we are listening to you, we are giving you an opportunity to add to the solutions that are required in the society. And then if the solution comes about, and the solution is one that does not allow um, conventional um, commercial vendors to be able to extract large sums of money from the government, you can't just now come and tell the young people, oh, we can't use this. What is that? That is nonsense. We can't be doing that. We have to look at them and say, okay, there's a place at this table for you because there can be a place for those same young people at the table that has the place for the commercial vendors that are making all the big bucks in the situation, whether it's cleaning up the swamp or fixing walkers or fixing an online solution problem, there is space for everybody and you cannot be pushing away the young people because what they are bringing is different and therefore disruptive to the economics of the decision makers. That has to stop. Thank you very much, Tyrone. And yes, you are getting major applause on this side and I, I, feel, I feel your... And we have with us uh, the Deputy Principal of UWA, who is one of the part sponsors of this, um, of these uh, consultations on Stockholm Plus 50. And welcome, Professor Moore. I'd love you please to respond to the statements and perspectives that we had a moment ago, if you don't mind. Thank you. Yeah, I think we're getting some really great perspectives coming through. Yes. Um, if I pick up on the last statement that uh, was made by Tyrone, the whole need for environmental studies. Um, this is an issue that we've been looking at for uh, on the campus for, for a while now, the whole notion of um, having these cross-disciplinary um, studies um, included in everyone's um, program. So that when you come to UWE, you don't, if you study economics, you don't just study economics, you have exposure to environment, you have exposure to politics, uh, and those are some of the things, and, and science in general, and those are some of the things that we try to cover in the foundational courses. I think what um, is probably needed is to move to the next step so that if you do do economics, you, have, you, you, you take it a little bit further and you go into the whole notion of environmental economics. Um, if you do politics, there's an opportunity to, for you to do notions in relation to green governance. Um, so those, that is the next step that needs to be taken in relation to the environment because it's such an important issue. Um, I've been researching the, note, the whole idea of climate change and the impact on the economy for a while now. And the numbers are, are, are really staggering if you take a look at them. Um, Barbados has an has a economy the size of around six, $6 billion. Mm -hmm. um, for us to, the, the potential impact in terms of climate change mm -hmm. is estimated to be around $25 billion. It means that over the, the next 100 years, we're going to lose $25 billion over that 100 year, over the next, by 20, by, what is, what is it, 2100, we're going to lose um, around $25 billion. That is a significant loss. It means that every single year, you're going to be losing around um, 4 or 5% of your GDP. 
It therefore has not just uh, an economic impact, it has an impact on poverty, it has an impact on employment opportunities, it, it has an impact on, on competitiveness um, as, a, as a small island developing state. So when you look at the numbers as an economist, you, you, get, you understand that it's a significant challenge and it therefore now becomes not just an economic issue that you have to look at, it becomes an overall issue for the entire economy, for politicians, for economists, for environmentalists, everyone has to get on board uh, in relation to this issue. And then there's, there's one other issue that I, I'll also like to mention as well, is the whole notion of fairness, and this came up a little bit earlier. Yeah. Um, usually when there's this idea of, of polluter pays, in, in economics, so that if you were to, and the, the Ministry of Environment knows this quite well, <laughs> so if you were to, to dump your garbage on my property, you should pay for dumping your garbage on my property. Um, it's, it's the fair thing to do. Uh, and what has happened over the last couple of years is that um, since the Industrial Revolution, developed countries have dumped their um, CO2 emissions um, into the environment and it has had an impact on small island developing states. We're the ones that are going to be um, significantly impacted. Um, and it is only fair that those countries that have polluted the environment pay for the damage that they have caused. The, the, the issue now is the capacity of small island developing states to absorb the funds if they are provided because you can provide uh, like a hundred billion dollars tomorrow for small and developing states and it still not ha have a significant impact because we don't have the capacity to, to develop the projects, you don't have the capacity to implement the projects. So it's not just the issue of providing funds, which was which is very important, but we also have to um, provide capacity to these small island developing states as well. So I can go on for a long time. Unfortunately, you don't give a professor a mic, um, but I'm gonna stop here so you can hand it back to the real stars of the show, the, the, the young persons. Thank you very much, Professor. Round of applause, and thank you for sharing your perspective. And don't be shy, we'll be back at you before the session ends. We are trying to move through fairly quickly, but I think we're getting some very rich discussion and some very positive uh, responses. I love that you're sharing your perspectives here. And I hope that you know that this is not the last of these sorts of sessions. I believe UNDP, UNICEF, UE, the Ministry of Environment see the value in hearing from all of you. And we want this to be an ongoing activity where we hear from the next generation who is tasked with managing uh, what we have called our environment. I see a hand going up at the back for some reason. Yes. Anyone? No? Okay. <laughs> All righty. So I'm going to go again to group two, but um, it's, it's along the same lines. Which sector is most important for green recovery from COVID-19 and why? Which sector is most important for green recovery from COVID-19 and why? And of course, I expect that our online persons as well as our groups one and um, any others in the room, you are free to respond. But I'm going to be asking group two to share their perspectives, please. Which sector is most important for green recovery from COVID-19 and why? Okay, so I am, um, I'm not seeing any hands go up yet. Hello. <laughs> Do you mind sharing what you think? Which sector you believe should be the one that we choose? Hmm? Your mind, okay. All right, I, I won't share that one. Any, do you want to share with us? No thoughts? You have some thoughts? Well, okay. So, so you mean from, from the question previously? Go right ahead. Mm -hmm. so, 
This is for the... Wait, going back to the actions required. Yeah, to the first question. To stimulate green... Um, I just wanted to add on that. I think it was Mr. King that mentioned that you can go younger with regards to recovery for green. And I think that is... Yeah, we're talking about um, like secondary school. Yes. But more importantly, I think we should also focus on the primary school aspect and to cater to those more specifically teachers, but not only teachers, teachers in training. I feel like it's extremely important to have um, teachers in training incorporated in these kinds of discussions because yes, we, um, we follow the curriculum, but we're not limited to it. And in incorporating these practices with the youth, as they grow older, they will, you know, have more environmentally um, sustainable practices and that will help in the long-term recovery process. Big round of applause. You're my favorite fan. <laughs> Thank you so much. Environmental education is very close to my heart, and I have had the opportunity to interact with teachers in training as it relates to sustainable development. I think that's probably one of the best things I've ever done in my life, well, apart from this, of course. So thank you very much for sharing, and we will take that on board. So group twos on this side. Anybody coming up to the mic? Which sector? Okay, anybody at this stage? Do I have anybody online who wants to take a, a, a jab at this particular query? Which sector do you think we need to rely upon most then in terms of achieving green, a greener recovery or green recovery from COVID especially? And why would that sector be the most important one? See how you can go out about and pick people now? Jeez. Oh. <laughs> you want to go or you want to go? I've not heard from you. No, ladies, don't take the first. <laughs> I think the sector that needs to be focused on the most would be healthcare. Okay. The healthcare sector, because we have a lot of people out there with a lot of complications, especially in Barbados. We need to tackle that. Mm -hmm. uh, we can't afford to lose out on those people and the resources that they have to offer especially the older ones who obviously are more at risk of dying from such. They have to train us as young people, well, help to train us as young people, give us more ideas, we interact with them, learn from them, talk to them. So I think the healthcare aspect is the most important. Okay, thank you. Very good. Any other thoughts? I've not seen any hands up on on the, on the, yes, go ahead. I think when you answer the question, um, it, you know, I don't think there's one specific sector because of the, you know, the environment plays a crucial role in all of our lives. So I think the best answer to say is that it really has to be a multi-sectoral approach because the environment looks at so many different <laughs> aspects of our lives. Thank you very, very much. Well said. Okay, so now group three, coming back to you all online, who has the greatest influence in creating a more sustainable future? Who has the greatest influence in creating a more sustainable future? I'm seeing... Hello? Uh, I'm sorry. Demal? Demali? Would you please go ahead? Alice, Alice as well? Damali, I, I thought you had your hand up. Yeah, yeah, yes, I did, but I'm kind of running errands now. I'll be free again in a minute or two. That's okay, go, go ahead. Okay, so Alice? Um, I will just read it out. Yes, go ahead. That's okay. Mm -hmm. um, so this comment is from Alice Lord, um, and her input is as follows. Younger persons have the voices and platforms to take a stand against unsustainable practices. For example, youth in the States have taken a stand against fast fashion companies such as Fashion Nova. We too can voice our displeasure and boycott where possible against those practices. However, on the flip side, the bigger companies also have to do their part and pull their weight. Thank you, Alice. Yep, I think that's a very, very clear point. Give her a round of applause. There's nothing wrong with being strong advocates. 
for what we believe in and the direction in which we want to go. So I, I much appreciate that. So I think, yes, just, there's another comment. Quickly, yeah. um, Tyron also shared input um, yes, saying comment. for him is the education sector. So mm -hmm. it's still part of the previous question. Yes. And back over to you. Okay, thank you. And I see that uh, there's a hand up with Ms. Phillip. Please go ahead. Ashanti. Hi. Yes. Hi. Yeah. So I believe the greatest influence to create in a more sustainable future would be the role of stakeholders. As Alyssa was saying, business owners, persons within that sector, because we know as a developing nation, we seek to always push the economy. So it's a situation where the policies developed are always in the direction or in favor of the economy or the direction the economy wants to go in. Because we know, as I believe Ms. Ashley would have said before, getting funding is an issue. So we always try to get funding, we always try to pursue it. So I believe the greatest influence of a sustainable future on a sustainable future would be stakeholders. Okay, thanks very much for your input. Quite good indeed. Okay, so we're on to our final question. And this question is being thrown out to all three groupings. What is the biggest barrier to a more sustainable future? What is the biggest barrier to a more sustainable future? Groups one, groups two, group three. What you consider to be the biggest barrier to a more sustainable future? I see there's a hand up. Yes, Rajani, please go ahead. And then Damali. Um, I think the biggest barrier to a more sustainable future is the fact that it is not the norm, that we would have to change the way society runs on a whole to be, be to become a more, to have a more sustainable environment. Like, for example, a lot of big companies um, dump and think because it's, it's cheaper because they make money. And then now we'll be asking them to put aside making money for the betterment of a future that they might not even enjoy themselves. So on a whole, even like to the last question, on a whole, I think even though that is a, a problem that affects the whole society, there is a small group of people that can actually help and change the way it is. And these people in the short run don't even benefit from this sustainable environment because they're making money now no matter what happens with the environment i think they're making money now that's what they're going to focus on because they're a company and they're looking at their profit they're not looking at the way that it might affect the the world that they live in it might affect the resources that they use it may not affect the people that they cater to so i think on a whole that is our biggest barrier the fact that we have to ask the economies to go against go against being a company for the betterment of a future that they might not even enjoy themselves. Thank you, round of applause on that. Very good consideration. Damali, you're up next. What are your thoughts? I think the biggest barrier is the apparent lack of political will um, from where I sit, especially, which also ties in with our capitalist and consumer society. I think those two things very briefly are the the biggest impediments to a more sustainable future for us all thank you very much and i think there are people in this room who are quite in agreement with you on that as well very good are there any other thoughts from the tables yes i see one of our colleagues from cyen coming forward um Good morning again. Um, I think the biggest barriers is we ourselves. Um, there's a lot of things that need to be done that, that needs to be done so that we can be able to achieve these sustainable goals. There's stuff like enforcement. Um, if we continue to make all these laws, policies, continue to attend all these conferences and we're just talking and we're not actually making actually doing what needs to be done if we are not educating the persons that don't know about the need to manage our environment if we are not approaching any environmental issues in the integrative approach including everyone right we talk about stuff like integrative water resource management 
we thought about stuff like um, sustainable development. But if we are not including each other, if we are not bringing up each other, if we are not disciplined enough to actually make the changes, well, what are we really doing? So I believe that the biggest barrier, we may say politicians, we may say businesses, but I think we as a collective ourselves are the biggest barrier. Very well said. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, please come forward. Oh, so Maxine and then um, Carla. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, everyone. I may just be echoing what um, our colleague here just said, because some people may want to identify the financial sector or education or policies. But at the end of the day, it all stems back to individuals and behaviors and perceptions. And once we have that intrinsic change within our society and changing all perspectives on what is needed and then are able to change our behaviors, then that affects our policies. That affects the way that we look at finances. That affects our businesses. That affects our education system. It affects our society around us. So one of the biggest barriers I would say is how is the perception and behaviors that we ourselves have as people, as human beings. And I think that is what is keeping us back at this point. Thanks very much, Maxine. Carla? Sorry, I neglected to introduce myself earlier. Carla yes. Daniel, That's Barbados okay. Sea Turtle Project. That's fine. Um, and working in conservation for, for the last little while and encountering a lot of challenges when it comes to, to the conservation of sea turtles and economies and um, development and so on, one of the things that I will say I see as the biggest barrier is the centralization of power. And when I say that, what I mean is that our biggest problem, I think, is fear. Fear of change, fear of success, and just not recognizing the power that we have as individuals, not just to change our behavior, but to break down barriers and to change the way our society operates. So if we don't like the policies that the government has, instead of saying something uh, in a way that will make those policies change, we tend to grumble quietly. If we think that there's too much capitalism and commercialism and um, Elon Musk has too much money and Amazon is getting too much money, we still shop with them, we still buy clothes from Xi'an, we still, we still do all of these things. So I think when we begin to recognize the power that we have as individuals and then we begin to to extend that power to others and to come together to really make the change that we want to see, it's not going to happen because I think we're comfortable sometimes in blaming or uh, looking to others for, for the big differences. So we think the earth needs to be saved. So we wait for the politicians to make the policies. We wait for the legislation. We wait for the small voices to get up and to shout and to say big things. And we just keep waiting and waiting and waiting and sitting on our laurels. I think what we need to recognize is that every single individual in here and on our island has the ability to make great change. It's not just your own behavior, but simply taking charge of the power putting our actions where our mouths are and telling the people who are in charge what we want to see them do and what we want to see happen uh, will we'll begin to make a difference. You know, one little voice is one thing, but when we all come together, I believe we can decentralize that power and take charge of our futures. Thanks very much, Carla. Well said. So at this stage, we now want to have some messages to the leaders. Given all that was said, given everything that we expressed, given the perspectives that we shared, I'm now going to call on three young leaders among us to come up front and to join my colleague Travis Sinkler from the Ministry of Environment in creating or in articulating the sorts of messages that we need to be taken to the leaders as part of this Stockholm Plus 50 process. I'm going to call on Khalil, Ashley, and Jerome. Please join us up front. You can bring your chairs and sort of be in this general region. Or you can stand and do it. OK, great. Because of COVID, we're still being very careful. So I'm just calling on the three of you to give your perspectives. Considering what we've just listened to, um, one of you can use the stand-in mic. Um, Travis has a, a mic here as well. Travis, do you want to give just a, a brief intro and, 
and some of what you've discovered today. And then I'm going to ask the three of you to give your thoughts. Okay. Thank you very much for your participation. And I hope everyone online can see and hear our, our three colleagues now who are going to give their perspectives on a message to the world leaders. Travis? Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. So this, the, the idea here is, given what was discussed, as Donna said, the questions put before you were taken from a global survey. Now we have three respondents. They have listened to what was discussed. We're looking to send messages from you, our youth here, to world leaders. And that's how it's being framed. I will also say I discuss with them the idea of packaging the, these ideas that they will share with you in a letter and actually send it to the UN. I was even thinking again, it could be transmitted via our foreign minister. I think it's important, we keep saying, yes, this is the world, the planet is for yours to inherit. Well, this consultation is nice, but how do we move? They need a little more. So I'm going to. We have with us Jerome, Ashley, and Khalil. You've heard, and I want you just to share one, two quick points. And I've, I've, I have three, three framing questions, and you can choose. The first is, what do you want to tell world leaders about the current planetary crisis? And the planetary crisis, you, you heard three today, biodiversity loss, pollution, and climate change. It was different in 1972. It was all pollution. The Minamata fish kills, the Sahil Desert. Um, it was persons dying from, in Wales, from that coal mine collapse. It, it was all about pollution. Um, so what is it that you would like to say regarding that? And what message on behalf of the young people here, this youth consultation, that could bring about a change. And what's a successful outcome for Stock One for 50? So just, I'm gonna begin with Khalil. Go ahead. Khalil? Yeah, okay. Thank you, thank you very much. And I, I, I will begin by saying that this exercise and certainly having listened over the past, uh, certainly the course of this morning, emphasizes the importance of these kinds of exercises uh, because the discourse has been incredibly enriched by the contributions that I have heard this morning um, from the persons who are here from the persons who are online. Uh, and it, what it says to me is that we need to continue to broaden this conversation. We've heard a lot this morning, I think, from most people that we need to take bold and decisive action and that in that connection, we must also seek at the same time to include not only the young people who are here today or the young people who are predisposed to, um, to joining online, but the broadest base of people. So that we heard a number of statistics, for example, that were truly chilling in my estimation, that we cannot allow to wash over us and, 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 and to, to, to become so numb to these things. Uh, Minister Ford spoke to the fact that at a certain point the ocean will have more plastic in it in terms of weight than fish. And that we hear that and you rush over it and you carry on with your day. But it is something that is incredibly um, mortifying for all of us uh, who, who, who inhabit this planet. And we cannot allow those things to, to, to just pass, pass over us. Or Professor Moore speaking to the fact, economically, that Barbados will lose or, or uh, could lose up to, well, what is it, four to six percent of its GDP every year due to climate change related effects. These are statistics that we need to ensure that people in the wider society, not only the people who are here, but the people who are in various spaces at different levels of the society are understanding and appreciating these things. So that perhaps, I'm always wary of the questions that ask about what is the number one thing or what is the largest or the biggest or so on. But certainly a most fundamental and significant thing is that we need to get 
everyone working on this, um, on this particular challenge together. What we have seen is that there are significant barriers and that there are very high barriers to action. That is because persons are accustomed to doing things in a particular way. You've heard, for example, that there is um, that, uh, a focus on economic and capitalist concerns uh, is significant. Uh, you've heard that there is an, a certain institutional lethargy uh, I, I can't recall who said it uh, in the, in the uh, online, but certainly in terms of what you heard very distressingly about what is happening with respect to uh, the, the wetlands and so on in Barbados. These are the kinds of very significant challenges we are facing. And I put it to you that we are able to mobilize action against things that seem so deeply ingrained, and we can only do that if the broadest base of people are involved and are advocating and are sounding their voices loudly. And that means that we go to people who we do not traditionally go to. Um, so that, for example, many, uh, several communities in Barbados are involved in, vo um, in voluntary recycling exercises. And that to, uh, to a man, in every, uh, those communities are by and large similar in terms of their socioeconomic positions. And it is, a, it, again, it is an uncomfortable reality, but the fact of the matter is that we have to see how can we get persons who are uh, in more vulnerable populations uh, to be able to equally take part in, in, in activities that are going to ensure our sustainable future. Um, the, there is not a great deal of research within the Caribbean context about attitudes, um, environmental attitudes, but broken down certainly by socioeconomic background. Uh, but what we see internationally is that by and large, the, 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 the groups that are most concerned with environmental issues that have it as top of mind are often not the most vulnerable in the, in the society because they have uh, certainly other concerns, economic concerns and so on. So how do we message therefore to that segment of the society to ensure that we can bring them along equally? And I think that we do that by seeking to pair so all of these sustainable development goals are related. We do that by seeking to pair our approach to poverty alleviation with our approach to environmentalism. So we do that by um, the uh, electricity and energy is a very significant cost. We do that by marketing energy saving as not only the fact that it will have a profound saving impact on the planet, but that it will also have a very significant financial um, uh, incentive. So that by incentivizing action, uh, through, for example, monetizing recycling, or mon uh, sorry, monetizing waste and, and financial incentives for recycling, those are the kinds of things that allow us to be able to reach the broadest base of people. Uh, we have heard time and again that it is a whole of society problem. And if it is a whole of society problem, then it requires a whole of society approach, as you heard in the video. And we cannot do it then, I have made the point before, that we cannot do it with only a small group of people. And, uh, and that uh, I will re-emphasize that point again, that there are significant and very high barriers to action. And we can surmount those barriers if we have as many people sounding their voices loudly as possible, because the things, the, the, the challenges that we face, the kind of pessimism, or well, I wouldn't even say pessimism, but the kind of weary caution that was espoused in the beginning by uh, Ms. Ms. Carrington and Ms. Daniel, uh, is well grounded because the challenges are so significant. But I, I, I think that we would do ourselves the greatest service by bringing along the greatest number of people on this journey. Ashley? Thank you, please. Hi again, everyone. So I just want to commend um, UNDP for um, establishing this activity. And what I must say is that after listening to the views of many young persons, we understand that we now have to go beyond the talk and take more action and that there needs to be a heightened level of climate education programs not only in Barbados but globally from the grassroots level when we're talking about accelerating climate action we need to ensure that young persons living with disabilities are also included into the conversation that young persons from all different sectors are of our communities 
are included into these discussions because at the end of the day, they are also they also contribute to the vulnerabilities that we're seeing within our societies. And as UNICEF ambassador, uh, we have realized and being engaged in various consultancies for young persons, we have recognized that the climate crisis is a child rights crisis and it infringes on the rights of our children and it deprives our children to access to quality water, equal education, food, clothing and shelter. And the climate crisis, like any other crisis, does not have the interests of our children and it's up to us to ensure that our children are protected and well educated on this issue. But also that our governments ensure that when speaking and developing uh, policies to mitigate and adapt better to the climate crisis that our children and our youth are at the center at all times. I know within the nationally determined contributions um, that was presented that young persons within Barbados weren't consulting and I think the government also needs to take a better approach in really ensuring meaningful youth engagement when developing our nationally determined contributions that were presented um, next time. And this morning, I remembered I was scrolling through my Twitter, and funny enough, I saw a tweet from Stockholm 50, and it stated that more than 3 billion people worldwide are still offline, and that there's a digital divide. It's not only driving poverty, it is also contributing to climate change and a whole other host of environmental problems which heightens the question and response to how can we ensure that each and every person has access to climate related information to take their own individual action. And funny enough, before I conclude, I, I also did a recent interview with the Voices of Youth by the United Nations on World Health Day. And I stated that the power of change starts with us. And that's how I would end today. Thank you. Thank you, Jerome. And j just, just uh, start home. What's a successful start home at 50? And, and Minister Ford referenced and was discussed here this issue of education, science. Your idea around a citizen science program, um, looking at this audience, is it possible? And how, looking at the next 50 years, how can something like that become a reality? Over to you. Thanks, Travis. You know, through another ingredient in the mix of my thought process. So I can say two things before I start talking. I just talk slow and I may go a glance down at my phone to keep on track so I don't ramble too much. But what you just mentioned fits into what I plan to say. I guess that's what you, you were thinking about having Jerome say something. But They got enough bright people in this room, and they got enough bright people that work on these issues over the last gazillion decades. As a result, I don't think nothing that we say today is going to be tremendously off, off base, it's directionally correct. We know that these are things that we want to do. We know that this is important. The, pro the, 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 the real issue that we face is how do we get to where we want to go? And what's the best path to take? The path of least resistance, the path that gets us to the greatest benefit. And I think that one of the first things we gotta do is understand that a lot of the people that spoke today spoke about that value system, that humanities value system. Because they talk about the economy. We talk about judicious and equitable use of resources. And I think that one of the important things we need to do coming out of this Stockholm conversation is a re and this is a real heavy, heavy thing to say, a reset of humanity's value system, what it is we say we want. If it is that we're talking about um, this is important and the metric that we use to say how valuable something is, is these imaginary tokens, then we gotta make sure and throw these tokens behind the things that we say that we value. The money gonna make sense. So when you have these climate change conversations, say, oh yes, we gotta talk about the smaller developing states and yeah, help the SIDS and gotta be equitable, then we gotta make sure that the money is equitable. Yes, we may talk about we can slow down the effects of um, these climate impacts and change the way we go about energy production, 
but the feedback loop is so long that small development states ain't got time to sit down and wait for you to do these things. It's no longer the time for small steps, no longer the time for empty discussion. You gotta put the money behind the things that you're talking about. And I think that it's not just the money, Winston spoke about that process. And I think that one of the things that we gotta do is have that work plan. From that vision to that action plan, and that action plan and that work plan go got performance indicators that we know that this healthy reef, how healthy is it? We did some transects, we understand that this is the health of the roof, reef and this is how it's changed over the years. And that is aligned with that economic structure that we got and we can know how much insurance and the impact of the cruise ship that may drop the anchor next to the reef and drag it across. All these things are dependent on the information that we have, the data that we have available, the way we process it, the way we're able to effectively and efficiently, continuously monitor these key performance indicators. And all that is just enough talk to say that we need the process in order to make it work. That value system needs to back that process, and then we gotta put money behind it. And I think that we got billion dollar problems, and if you're talking to leaders and people that got deep pockets, I think that if we got billion dollar problems, we need billion dollar solutions, and that means we gotta create billion dollar projects that can help all the people in this room put these billion dollar ideas into a framework that can make it work. And that's just my two cents. Thank you, Jerome. Thank you, Khalil. Thank you, Ashley. We were planning to have an additional session, but we're going to stop it here. What I would like to say, um, given what we've heard, the minister called on UNICEF, UNDP, youth organizations to look almost at a new development pack when it comes to environment and building legacy initiatives. Just with a show of hands, when that conversation starts about action, who will be willing to be a part of that? Just, just, just by a show of hands. Listen, if, if there's anyone here that put a hand, I can tell you, put it your hand. All right? So, 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 so listen, I mean, good. So I, 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 again, um, because a, a, a lot is happening. I know we, we have, you know, some of you have your own institutional mandates, you know, persons are at school and whatnot, but what's coming through, you need to start and, and there's a, a collective effort I see evolving. UNDP plans to run a six month program beyond June and I think that is a time to frame actions moving forward. I've also heard about the Ministry of the Environment engaging others. Well, I'm happy to say Donna is coming back to the Ministry of the Environment from June. Uh, we have been without an environmental education officer for four years. All right, four years. So I'm just happy that, and she obviously will play a, a big role in that. So again, I want to hand this. I want to thank you. I want to hand this back to the moderator um, and to UNDP for the wrap up. Thank you. Thanks a million, Travis. And yes, um, you will see more of me if you want to. I certainly would love to see more of all of you. I can't say enough thank yous to all of you for participating today, those online and those of us who met here in this room. After two years of COVID, so many things just seem to have gone by the wayside. These interactions just seem to have gone to sleep. And for a Ministry of Environment also to not have, um, you know, a good, strong environmental education program going for, for a while, that too isn't always the best or ideal situation. But given what we've heard here today, we know that even though we can't say, um, well, that the future is bright, we do know that we have bright sparks that can take us into the future. And again, I must commend all of you as young people for coming out and participating in today's activity. We promise you 
that this is not the last. This is basically the beginning of a new era of consultation for young people because you all are basically inheriting what comes next. You have to be the decision makers, the policy makers, the people who will have the collective strength, understanding, and definitely the will to do something different. So your advocacy is important, your communication, your, in, your education, and sharing knowledge with everyone around you, not just the, the youngsters. There are a lot of us oldsters who don't know enough either. And we really want you to be a part of not just national development or regional development, but certainly global advocacy. So thanks again for being here. Thanks for being a fantastic group of people who participated in an otherwise not so exciting um, topic. Environment has never been sexy. I'll tell you that. <laughs> but we do our best because we know the importance of inheriting an earth and passing on an earth that we can all be proud of, but more than anything else, that we can then pass on to the next generation. So thanks again for all your time and for your participation. Thank you, UNDP, Government of Barbados, UWI. And now I'm going to hand over to Crystal to just say a quick thank you. So well done. Round of applause to all of you. Good morning, I believe it's still morning. It's afternoon. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, what can I say? Uh, on behalf first of Professor Winston Moore, who's the National Coordinator for the Stockholm Plus 50 Barbados process, I want to thank each and every one of you here and those online for your participation. Um, I would say I am the generation that is in the bridge. I was born before technology. Um, but yet I'm still savvy enough to, you know, make my rounds on Twitter and see what's happening in the Twitter space. And what I will say is being exposed to this area of environment and sustainable development, I now for sure see the need for every person coming through our educational system to have exposure to sustainable development, climate change issues, environmental issues. It has to be something that is paramount that is on the minds and consciousness of all of our young people. And I want to also say on behalf of those um, who are behind the scenes and, and putting together this national report, which will inform the global report, your thoughts, your views, your ideas will be a part of our national report. And I'm sure that Travis will make sure that that message to our world leaders is formed and packaged in a way that is placed on the global stage. So be um, encouraged. I know sometimes it is, it is a, it seems as though it's an uphill climb. Um, myself, I have those days, but hearing you guys today really has encouraged me. It has heartened me because there is enough of us already on this movement to reach that critical mass. I believe that Kalu was speaking about to bring more persons together and on board to make a change. So thank you, everyone. Uh, I encourage, I invite you now to, to have a, a wonderful lunch, interact with each other safely, of course. Uh, and as Donna said, look out for the next phase of this, this youth engagement um, in relation to the Stockholm Plus 50. So thank you all. Ladies and gentlemen, lunch is being served in the foyer right outside where we had our break. So please go ahead and do enjoy. Looking forward to seeing you soon again. Bye-bye.